Hi everyone, today's video is how I did Alfie here, the Border Terrier in pastels. So just like with most of my other portraits, I usually start with the eye and I usually use my black Carbofello to block in the basic shape. Once I'm happy with that and I've got that all mapped in, that's when I'll start to add the colour and then I'll work in the pupil. Now sometimes if you've got a really bright highlight, you can do what I'm doing here and leave that part of the paper showing and apply your white pure pastel pigment so that you get that highlight as bright as you possibly can. Now if the highlight is a little bit dull, just like what I'm doing here, I'll apply a layer of grey and then put a white highlight on top. Now you saw that I left that brightest white highlight, I didn't put any pastel pigment as a base layer and then just used my white pit pastel to get a nice bright highlight just in that small area. But if an eye had um, an overly bright highlight across the top of the eye I would just leave all of that and I would not put any base layer down at all and just put pure white pastel down. If there is a subtle grey tone to it I will then overlap with a grey on top of the white just so that you've got your lightest pigment down first. Once I've got the eye in place that's when I usually start building above on the section above the eye or below the eye. Now I like to work in small sections because I feel that I am achieving more quicker and I think by getting it up to about 80% complete you feel like you're achieving more because the portrait is already coming to life rather than working on your base layer to start with and then adding layers individually thereafter. I think that can sometimes make you feel like you're not achieving the same the same process and it does appear slower so this is definitely working in small sections my preferred way to work with 99% of my portraits apart from when I did a, a Westie tutorial here with they didn't have any voiceover but you, I deliberately did that layer by layer just to show how I do each layer step by step. Now I just want to say thank you to everyone who's messaged me about Patreon. I am almost there with setting it up and launching it. I've just got a couple more videos to upload and get everything finalised before it's ready. So thank you so much for all your comments. I really do appreciate it. But as I say that I'm hoping that that's going to go live. I'm aiming for the 1st of February. Fingers crossed that I can get it all done in time. But if you do need any more information on that, then don't hesitate to pop any comments below or send me an email or message me over on my social media and I will forward you some more information on that. Now in my Patreon videos, they will be up to three hours long with a lot of real time clips and considerably slower. So you can see exactly how I layer. I will explain why I'm choosing the colors that I'm choosing and you, it was very much a step-by-step -step tutorial on exactly what I am doing through each of the processes. I don't leave anything out, there's no secrets, everything I do is included in my videos depending on what portrait that video is focused on at the time. So with Alfie here, you can see with when you tackle a coarser type of fur, just like a border terrier, you do have to layer slightly differently. Now what I've done is I've applied a really good base foundation layer and I'm then applying my lights on top basically getting in where my basic brights are first and then you'll see I'm going in with some darker colours as well just to break up those sections. Now it's really important when you are doing more coarser wiry fur to have a really good foundation because I know that when I draw breeds like this, I am really, really tempted to draw all of the coarser fur, which you can see closest to the viewer first. Now that is not what you should be doing. It needs to be the other way around. So forget those details on top, just like these little black lines that I've put, which are a, some kind of whisker on top of the eye there, which some dogs have. If I was to be trying to put that in first, you're then trying to work around it. Leave all these details last and the most wiry looking fur last you are still wanting to draw the fur and the colours and the tones which would be closer to the skin. And then once you've got a good foundation down, that's when you can start focusing on building more of the coarser fur. Now when you are doing the coarser fur, it is still very much a layering process. Don't, once you've got your base layers down, then go to add all your details in one go. You still need to break each layer down in segments. So once you've got your base layer down, you need to then work on the layer which is on top of that, but that still would not be the fur that is closest to the viewer. So you need to, the fur that overlaps everything else, just like whiskers, because on with, with wiry fur, that is definitely the case. You still have strands of fur which are 
in relation to the same layer as where the whiskers would be because it overlaps and it can you know almost appear like it sticks out so you want to be drawing all those at the right time and not too early because you will certainly be making more work for yourself in the long run so the ear is a little bit different because these especially with border terriers they do tend to have darker ears than the fur on their face so i make sure as with lighter layers you get your your base layers down accurately now for this area i haven't used my soft tools or my eye makeup applicator tools which the reason why i use those i go into in depth with my in my patreon videos for those but i haven't used that method for putting my base layers down on this ear because it is a smaller area there was a lot of color differences between the mid-tones and the dark so i wanted to make sure that i put them in accurately now again, I go into a lot of you know in-depth information and step-by-step -step process as to how I put my base layers down, either with my soft pastel stick with my soft tools or my eye makeup applicators, or whether or not I'm using the pencils directly themselves. But as I say for this, because it was a smaller area, I opted for my pencils to make sure I could get my base layers as accurate as I could. So you'll see I started with a darker base layer so that I could build my brights on top. That is exactly the same process and how I work for most of the portraits. There are some fur that you'll do slightly differently, but most of the time this is the case. You want to be building from dark to light. Now the one thing with wiry and coarser fur is you want to have those stray strands of fur overlapping. It is that capturing those details which will create that effect of that wiry fur. This fur is not anything like Labrador fur or anything like that where it is shorter and all follows a similar direction. It is, there are bits of fur that when you're drawing make no sense at all. That's absolutely fine and sometimes there were parts of this portrait where I was like, well where does that bit of fur go? If you do think like that and you get to a part of the portrait where you don't quite know, you're a bit stuck, turn your artwork upside down and your reference photo upside down and your brain will then see the the shapes and the curls for what they are rather than your brain thinking this should be fur but it doesn't look like fur so just turn it upside down and that will certainly help once i was pretty happy with the left side of the face there i then went in and blocked in the nose and the surrounding area now the reason why i did that is because this is one of the darker areas of the subject now you've probably heard me talk about this before, you need to get your darker values in first because when you start working on areas next to it like what I am doing here, quite often you don't get your tones right if you then start working on the darker section next to it afterwards because it's not until that point that you realise you haven't gone light enough or you haven't gone dark enough. So put your darker values in first and then build up with the areas next to it so that you've got a really good you know, a good foundation with your darkest values in already to know how far you need to go with your shadows and how far you need to go with your highlights, just like what I'm doing here. Now, what I'm doing at the moment is it looks, obviously this looks really ugly at this stage, I'm just mapping in where my basic lights are. Now on the muzzle area, there was sections here where the fur clumped together rather than individual fur strands. So I wanted to get those base highlight sections in showing where these clumps of fur were and then I'm going to build up my fur in between these spaces and around it. Now the reason why I opt for doing this is because I think with something like this and especially how the fur changes in many directions I think it would be really easy to get lost in where you are. So you can see here that's why I'm now putting in the whiskers in between these sections because otherwise I think you would be tempted to put them in slightly the wrong position and they would overlap in the wrong way. So because this fur is curled and it creates various shapes, these whiskers were intertwined with these layers and clumps of fur. So it's understanding, it's looking at your reference photo and realising in this instance, that whisker is behind that curl, whereas this one is in front of it. And that's exactly why I blocked in where my basic light areas were first. Now obviously I'm trying to cram in as much information as I can for you with these 20 minute videos that I upload on YouTube, but this all is much slower over on Patreon. So they, like I say, they are up to three hours so I can explain everything step by step and ex you can see exactly how I'm moving the pencils because that's another thing I go in depth about. Depending on how you hold the pencil, where you hold the pencil and how much pressure you apply to that pencil, you will get completely different fur strokes. And this is 100% the case, especially when working on a lot of texture like what we're doing here. So 
I go into that in a lot of depth. Obviously, it's a, you can't really see the pencil strokes here with how fast I have to make these videos on YouTube here. But I go into a lot of in-depth about that and exactly how I'm doing each first stroke if I'm aiming for something slightly different and I'm trying to get a different texture, a different fur length, a different fur thickness and that type of thing. So once I've got most of this portrait in on the left side, that's when I'm now starting to work on the right eye. Now the reason why I do it like this is because I like to do each portrait in small sections and once I've got the right eye in, I can then start working on the fur around it, just like what I did with the left side. Once you work like this and you get into the routine of working like this and you build up this section and then it starts to get to the same level as the left side, you can step back at your easel, you can look at this portrait and think, that looks like that dog already. Whereas if you do your first base layer, you then apply your second layer, for instance, and you step away from it, you are at that, what I, well, the ugly stage of a portrait, which all of them go through before you start adding detail. You, it looks like you're stuck at that point for far too long, and I think you can start to get disheartened that your portrait is not progressing how you would like it to. So this is why I've always opted for working in smaller areas, because it's really rewarding when you step back from your easel and you look at that portrait and you think that looks like that reference photo, that looks like that dog. You can tell that this is Alfie. So that is why I prefer to work in this way. So this pencil that I'm using there was the white Caran d'Ache pencil, the Chinese white. And the reason why I use that last for my brightest highlights is because it's a softer lead. So it's slightly more opaque than your Carbofello or your Pit Pastel, your white Pit Pastel. So use that white last if you need to get some brightest highlights because that will show up much better over your other layers compared to your white Carbofello and your white Pit Pastel just because the lead is that much softer. So this is the area where I'm using a soft tool to put in my base layers, which as again I mentioned, I go in depth with my Patreon channel, why I do it this way. It is definitely my preference. I don't like using the soft pastel sticks directly to the paper. One of the most common questions I'm asked is why don't my pastel pencils go over the top of my soft pastel base layers? And the reason is because you've applied the, the, the soft pastel stick directly to the paper. When you do that, it is very easy to fill the tooth of the paper. So when you go over with your pencils, there is no tooth left for that pigment to grip to the paper. So the only option, if that has happened, is you either, you know, if you are really struggling to get your layers on top, you either have to apply a workable fixative to put that tooth back on the paper, or you have to try your best and cope with, you know, the amount of tooth you've got left, or you have to start again. It's very frustrating when you get to that point because you've put in all that effort for your base layers and then your pencil details can't go on top. I personally, if I got to that stage, I would then use a workable fixative because it would be a real shame. I'd hate throwing artwork away because it's... I always think you should finish a portrait because you learn so much, especially if you have made a mistake. So I would persevere, unless obviously you made a hole in your paper, a hole in your canvas or that you spilt something on it, that sort of thing, I would start again. But what if it's something like that, it's a learning process, so I would stick at it, apply a workable fixative, and then put your detailed layers on top of that. Just bear in mind, if you are using a workable fixative or any fixative, it will change the colour of your portrait. However, if you're not finished, it really doesn't matter because you're going to be putting layers on top. So this portrait was A3 size, which is about a 12 by 16, and there were three subjects on it. So... There was Avatar the horse, Alfie the border terrier, and then in the bottom right corner there is um, Leo the Labrador. Now you can see in relation to the size of my fingertips how small his head was on this portrait. Now that being said, you can still get a decent amount of detail as you can see here. I've managed to get a lot of texture still by applying loads of layers with a light hand and sharp pencils. That is the absolute key, especially if you're working on something a little bit smaller like what we are here with Alfie. If you get your layout right, you can fit, as I have done here, multiple subjects on sizes which you might think are a bit smaller for three subjects. However, if you get your placement right and you design your layout correctly, it can really work and be nice and, and really effective. We were able to position all three of these close together, which meant I could make each subject as big as I possibly could on that paper. Now what I do is I design every single portrait I do in a photo editing software on my laptop. The reason for that is I like to send multiple options to my clients so they can pick their favourite layout. 
for this because there was multiple subjects on that one portrait they could be positioned slightly differently and in different orders so I wanted to make sure that my client could pick which one she preferred and then there's no surprises we both know what we we know she knows what the finished portrait's going to look like and I know what I have to do to make it look like that so make sure you do all that in enough time before you go to start your portrait so that you know exactly what you've got to do for that set portrait even if you have a head and shoulder and it's just one subject it's a really good idea to do your background options you know your paper color choices especially because pastel matte comes in so many lovely colors to do that beforehand so that you know and you're prepared before you start the portrait i will just like to mention if you could give the video a thumbs up if it was of use that would be really good it really does help and if you want to get notified of future content um, hit the subscribe button in the bottom corner here and then hit the bell button so you get notified of videos that i upload so you can see once I've got these cheek areas in and I'm happy with the layers I've put down, I'm then going through and putting the finer details on top which is those whiskers. Now as I say usually whiskers overlap everything else but with fur such as this it is intertwined with everything else so make sure you pay close attention to your reference photo and make sure that you put these whiskers whether or not there's a clump of fur in front of it, behind it and so on so pay really close attention to your reference photo. So now I'll start work on the muzzle. So what I've done with my black pencil, I've just put in where those sort of those clumps, where those fur strands get to merge together. And that's just because where his muzzle there was a little bit wet at the bottom. So it's really important to put those details in, especially on fur like this, because it adds to the texture. Now, in order to put these lighter highlights on top, you have to make sure that your base colours are dark enough. If you put your mid-tones or your lights on top of your base layers and you find that they're not bright enough, the reason often is is because your base layers aren't dark enough. Make those layers a bit darker and then your lighter pencils and your lighter layers will show up on top that much easier. So Alfie had a leather collar on. Now obviously the main thing about this when you're working on a slightly smaller scale is just to focus on your lights and your darks and get your contrast right. You're not going to have heaps of room to put loads and loads of detail and really this collar it was more there was no real stitching type detail it was mainly about focusing on where your lights and darks are. So for this make sure you get your values right that is what's going to make your portrait realistic more than colour. You know you can have the exact perfect colour but if you haven't got your contrast right and it's flat and all one tone then that is not going to look as realistic. You could get the colour a bit different because we all interpret colour you know differently depending on what we see. So you want to make sure that you get your lights light enough and your darks dark enough. It's really really important and that is how you're going to make your portrait appear that much more realistic. Just like what we're doing here with the tags and the metal work if I didn't get these highlights in place, it would look really flat. But because I've put these highlights where the metal curves over and it's catching the light in that way, it makes that look like metal. It's not the colour at all. I've only used grey values for this. But because I've got my lights and my darks in the right place to add that contrast, it automatically looks realistic purely just by getting your values right. So for this, Alfie's chest is behind the horse and the Labrador. So I wanted to fade out his chest so that there was no sharp edges between these two subjects that are going to be more in the foreground. We want to make Alfie look like he's ever so slightly positioned back. The reason why we did this is because it best suited this layout with three subjects on this size. By me able to you know, put the Labrador's ear in front of his chest, it meant that I could make that Labrador that much bigger. And you don't want, it's far better to overlap a portrait, for instance, with an ear of another subject on the chest than it would be if I was to position Alfie at the front and cut off the, the Labrador's ear in that bottom right corner. That wouldn't look so so good. So make sure you pay attention when you do your layouts and you know pay consideration to elements like that because it's that that will make your portrait just flow that much nicer. One thing to note as well, make sure you've got a few fur strands that overlap the collar just so that the collar doesn't look like it's stuck on. There are going to be, especially with fur types like this, where the fur does overlap that collar in certain areas. So make sure you capture details like that so the collar is part of the, the portrait. So I hope this video was of use. Don't, you know, feel free to pop any comments below of future content you'd like me to create and I'll try and get that added to my list and, you know, to make YouTube videos based on that. 
Um, and again, if Patreon is of interest, then don't hesitate to get in touch with me. I am hoping it's going to be launched very, very soon in the next week. So I'm just building a library there so that people that do subscribe have access to immediate content. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, but it will all be announced on my social media and I'll mention it in a video here. Another update on my video that I upload on Saturday. Thank you for watching. Bye.